Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, thank you for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me, as always, is a man that knows that it's all fun and games until the beer runs out. He is the captain. It's all fun and games till someone lost and deny. It's good to be seen, and it's good to see you, unless you lost an eye. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. This week, we are very happy to be featuring Juicy IPA by our friends at Squatters Craft Beers. This is a fresh glass of deliciousness, packed with bright citrus aromas and notes of ripe stone fruit. This unfiltered Northeast IPA finishes smooth, creamy, and pulp-free, garage-grade, four out of five bottle caps. And we want to thank our friends for filling up the fridge this week. First up, a big thank you and cheers to Julia a.k.a. The Professor, in Bowling Green, Ohio. Julia, Julia, Gulia. Big shout out to Lauren in Sugarland, Texas. Next up, here's a cheers to Casey in Missoula, Montana. A big shout out to Matt and Erica in Ridgecrest. And here we go, Captain. We have Richard in Palmerston, Otega, New Zealand. And last but certainly not least, we have Franziska mm-hmm. in Berlin, Germany. Everyone we just mentioned went to truecrimegarage.com and contributed to this week's beer fund. And for that, we give you a big hug and a big kiss and a big thank you. Yeah, B-W-E-R-U-N, beer run. For everything True Crime Garage, check out truecrimegarage.com. Make sure you follow us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, all that stuff, at True Crime Garage. And that is enough of the business. All right, everybody, gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. July 2017. During court proceedings, 48-year-old Jennifer Doulis requested an emergency custody order, begging the court for sole custody of her five children. A portion of the request reads as follows, quote, I am afraid of my husband. I know that filing for divorce and filing this motion will enrage him. I know he will retaliate by trying to harm me in some way. He has the attitude that he must always win at all costs. He is dangerous and ruthless when he believes that he has been wronged. During the course of our marriage, he told me about sickening revenge fantasies and plans to cause physical harm to others who have wronged him. For example, flying a plane over an ex-client's home and dropping a brick on his house. I fear for my family's safety, and I believe him to be highly capable and vengeful enough to take the children and disappear. Jennifer's husband, 49-year-old Fotis Doulis, denied all Jennifer's assertions and responded that Jennifer was unstable and unfit to parent their children. He said that she took the children from him without warning. Judge Thomas Colon denied the emergency custody order, instead putting in place a plan of custody whereby the parents would share legal custody while the divorce was settled. Judge Colon wrote, It is clear that in the weeks immediately preceding the filing of this action, the atmosphere in the party's home deteriorated. The plaintiff was upset over the breakdown of the marriage and what she perceived to be the defendant's controlling and aggressive behavior. The defendant became upset because he felt that he could no longer control the situation and unilaterally dictate the outcome. Arguments followed, including in the presence of the children. Things were said in anger. However, 
The court is hopeful that once things settle down and cooler heads prevail, these extremely well-educated and accomplished parents will be able to reach an agreement on a mutually acceptable parenting plan with the assistance of their experienced and talented counsel. But as we shall soon see, cooler heads did not prevail. Less than two years later, on May 24, 2019, at 6.59 p.m., the New Canaan, Connecticut Police Department received a report of a missing woman. Her name, Jennifer Doulis. This report was filed by phone by a Laurel Watts. This is True Crime Garage, and this is the case of Jennifer Doulis. Fotis Doulis grew up in Greece, part of a large traditional Greek family. He excelled in both snow skiing and water skiing. Fotis attended Brown University, graduating in 1989 with degrees in economics and applied mathematics. After Fotis worked for some big-name firms such as Ernst & Young doing management consulting, he got his master's degree in finance from Columbia University, this in 1997. He married his first wife in 2000, but then he met Jennifer Farber in the Aspen airport. Jennifer was the beautiful and privileged daughter of Hilliard and Gloria Farber. Because of Hilliard's successes, this was an extremely wealthy family. Jennifer had also attended Brown when Fotis was there, but they didn't know each other back then. Jennifer, too, got her master's degree. This was in writing from NYU's Tisch School for the Arts. She was a very busy writer. We are talking journalism, essays, plays, and screenplays, and even a novel. She loved reading and traveling. It's not clear when exactly Jennifer and Fotis started seeing each other, but it is clear that it was when Fotis was still married. He divorced in July of 2004. And Jennifer and Fotis were married within months. They lived in the Farmington Valley area in Connecticut, where Fotis started up his own company, the Four Group, a prominent residential builder constructing custom luxury homes in the wealthy Farmington Valley and Fairfield County areas of Connecticut. Fotis's MO was to build a mansion or even a small development and move his family into the new home until it sold. Jennifer and Fotis had two sets of twins and a baby girl in quick succession. Yeah, they had a total of three boys and two girls. The family was very busy with multiple nannies employed at once. People were coming and going from their homes constantly. This because Fotis ran his business out of his home, whichever house he was living in at the time. Right. Now, before we get too far along, one thing I really want to point out here, I want to point this out now, because later in this case, there will be a lot of moving pieces. So please just note that Fotis runs his business out of his home. So when we say the office or his house, either way, it's the same location. This did not always go over well with the neighbors, because imagine this, you're living in this very wealthy upscale area mm -hmm. and this guy's got trucks and men coming and going constantly in what's supposed to be this quiet residential area but also not to mention that he is of a different ethnicity so sometimes that doesn't play too well in these areas one neighbor on the four group built cul-de-sac of four homes this is in an area called avon called the police on Fotis numerous times for things like residential zoning violations and noise violations. This former neighbor recounted to us that Fotis was enraged by this and confronted her on the street on a number of occasions. On one occasion, threatening her in her own driveway. Despite this, Fotis was generally considered to be charming and charismatic by most. However, you can see by this behavior he was a hothead. 
Right. He insisted on getting his way. He was, in my opinion, controlling and arrogant as well. Also seems like he was such a, a bully towards women. At some point, the family moved to Farmington. The address was for Jefferson Crossing. This was, in fact, constructed by Fotis's company. This is a massive brick mansion with six bedrooms and a 13,000 square feet of living space. Wow. Yeah. This area, you could play baseball in this house. You could put 20 of my houses in that house. This area of the Farmington Hills is very upscale. Fotis was developing a number of properties in this very immediate area. Now, it's not clear exactly when the marriage started to go south. There was some good and some bad, as there is with most marriages. It is said by friends of Jennifer that she, at some point, was suspicious. She suspected Fotis had a wandering eye. He was... A, <laughs> wait, 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 so... Put that eye on a leash. So she met him while, while he was married. They had an affair that obviously she knew about and now she's questioning his wondering eye so when the wondering eye works out in your favor it's okay but now it's not okay you know i i always immediately think of that as well but then i try to like put myself in the position of somebody that finds himself in a relationship like this mm -hmm. and then i start to wonder i'm like i i think what the way this goes down captain is that a lot of times when you are the one being pursued or you're starting up this new relationship with this married man or married woman, I think you make a lot of assumptions or at least believe the other person that the marriage that they're in is just horrible. Like it's a, right. it's a nightmare. It's already over. We're living separate lives. It's just a matter of signing some papers. Well, that's what they can make you think. Right. Right. And then you get involved in this and you think, well, we're truly in love. He wouldn't do that to yeah, me or right. she wouldn't do that to me. We have a great relationship. We have five children and we live in a big, beautiful brick mansion that we play baseball in and i'm not saying this happened for for certain because there's no evidence of that but i have sometimes met couples where instantly i'm going this, this guy seems a little controlling of his wife and they normally have a lot of children it's almost like they put that into play as a way to control their Keep spouse them at home yeah well, and as you said, you get the vibe that he's a bit of a bully towards women. There's there one way to bully a woman is and mistreat her is to go outside of the marriage. Mm -hmm. And they, these two are both attractive, well-educated people. The other issue, and I think where her suspicions come into play, is he's gone a lot. He's away from the home a lot. He's at water ski competitions that he participated in. Mm -hmm. These are in other states, sometimes in other countries. He's out skiing in Aspen or visiting Greece because he has extended family there. Then in the early 2017, they decided to sell the home. They listed the house and enrolled the kids in the new Canaan country school. But all of this blew up when Jennifer discovered in March of 2017 that Fotis was, in fact, having an affair. Mm -hmm. This, you know, enter Michelle Traconis. Was she a ski instructor? She was, I believe, down in Argentina. So I was just, I, I was just, I was just making a joke. But. She was involved in skiing in some form. Right. Now, things deteriorated fast once this took place. On June 3rd, 2017, Lauren Almedia, who by this point has been employed by the Dulleses for over four years now as one of their nannies. She says that she witnessed the following. She heard yelling and thudding footsteps as Jennifer ran through the home being chased by a clearly angry Fotis. Jennifer ran into the master bedroom and slammed the door behind her. Lauren and one of the children were already in this room. So they're in the room with her as well. And she says she could hear Fotis pounding on the door in rage. Jennifer braced her back against the locked door and Fotis finally walked away, realizing, you know, probably realizing that one of his kids and the nanny were in this room as well and had witnessed the whole thing. Right. Shaking in fear, Jennifer told Lauren that she was very afraid of her husband and that he had threatened to take all five of their kids away from her 
and moved to Greece. Now, Lawrence soon after observed another incident where she found Jennifer crying in the driveway. She told Lauren that Fotis had tried to run her down with his vehicle and she had to jump out of the way of his car as he drove off in, in another fit of rage. Yeah, but to be fair, a lot of times if your friend's going through a divorce, you only kind of hear one side of whatever is happening. And especially if you've been friends with that couple for a long time, sometimes you have to, you know, take that story with a little bit of a grain of salt and say, is this actually happening? Is he being as threatening as she claims or, or is this, um, just to get me on her side? Well, it could be to get her on her side. The, the only, the only issue I take with that is we, one of these things, events she witnessed herself, right? Right. She was present there and probably afraid as well. And she's, Look, I'm sure that they had some kind of friendly relationship, but at the end of the day, she's the nanny. She works for both of them. Right. Um, you know, all these things. De- devil's advocate there. These things are all adding up, of course, and eventually Jennifer is going to have enough of this behavior. She packs up her things and left, taking the five children with her. Now, at this time, the five children, they range in age from 8 to 13. She's away with the kids, and she's going to really upset Fotis further because not only did she take the children, but she's refusing to respond to his calls and to his text. Right. Now, at this point in her life, is she an avid writer? No, I think the the writing slowed down significantly once she started having children. Right, because sometimes as this divorce happens, you'll see... Um, the one of the parents used the children as leverage, go away, not respond. And then sometimes the other spouse uses money as leverage, but she comes from money. So I'm just pointing out that she has a lot more options than the average mother with five kids would have. Oh yes. You're, you're spot on, man. She comes, not only does she come from money, she comes from wealth, right? Her, her family is extremely wealthy and she wasn't like snobby about it or weird about it or anything like that. She was from all accounts I could find. She's pretty down to earth. I think the major concern here, and we've seen this unfortunately too many times where someone has easy access to live in another country, right? Takes the children and goes to that other country. And then we have a hard time getting those kids back. For the parent that that is stuck here. Well, and in this scenario, we've seen it through the throughout the time of doing the show and and learning a lot about abusive situations. And here, Jennifer's in this abusive situation. And a lot of times, these women that that have the five kids that have no money, that have no means, because they're staying at home and doing this huge job of raising the kids that the spouse then, like I said, controls that money. And uh, these women in abusive situations have a really hard time of just, it's not as easy as just packing up everything and getting out of there. So the fact that she has these resources is, is really good. Yeah, and I think the threat of what she is afraid of is very real here. We have a guy that could very easily just take the children. He says he's taking them to McDonald's one afternoon, and next thing you know, they're on a plane to Greece and he's shacking up with family there, and she has lost her children. Right. So she's not responding to his phone calls or to his text. I think it's out of fear that he's going to take the children, not so much that she's trying to hold them or dangle them over his head like some kind of carrot here. Uh, he gets upset. He calls the police. This is on June 19th to report his children as missing, saying, quote, I'm worried about my wife and kids because they left to go to New York and I haven't been able to get in touch with them. I've been texting and I see that the texts are being delivered, but no one is responding to me End quote police I, found I, the children. I'd also really like to read what those texts are. Cause I'm sure they're not just, Hey, are you okay? Please let me know you're okay. I'm sure those texts were verbally abusive. 
Well, the the police's statement is that they did find the children and they found them, quote, safe and secure with their mother. Now, Jennifer moved into 69 Wells Lane in New Canaan. Uh, This is a very exclusive town of less than 20,000 people, a suburb of New York City. This house, I mean, it sounds like, you know, I hate to keep kind of running around this here that she comes from wealth and has plenty of money. Most people in this situation would find themselves, you know, dire straits. We don't have much money. We're going to have to go live someplace else on an emergency situation. The house that she's renting is a 9,800 square feet home that that the Zillow website estimates its value at $3.5 million. Well, you can't go from 13,000 to 1,200. Go yeah. 13,000 to 9,000. It's also closer to her mother, to Jennifer's mother, who is quite helpful with the children and and with Jennifer. Now, she, Jennifer, filed for divorce on June 20th, 2017, and from the get-go, the proceedings were contentious. The two parties have filed nearly 500 motions between them. In her court filings, Jennifer claimed that Fotis, quote, exhibited irrational, unsafe, bullying, threatening, and controlling behavior, end quote. Heck, you heard the statement in the trailer of his violent fantasies of revenge against people who have wronged him or or threatening to take the kids and go to Greece. Yeah. She also said that Fotis made a specific threat to kidnap the children and take them to Greece or another country and, quote, you will never find us, is what she says he said. If, If she did not agree to his terms in the divorce, he's trying to control this whole divorce thing. Jennifer emphasized that Fotis's scary behavior had significantly intensified as the proceedings went along and states that she was now afraid for her safety. The judge required the Dulleses to refrain from any travel, keep the kids away from any romantic partners that they may have, and to work to establish a mutually agreeable custodial plan. Fotis was losing it with this situation. This situation is beyond his control. He reasserted his claims that Jennifer was an unfit mother and that she was a pill popper. This in all in the court filings. We spoke with one of Jennifer's friends who saw Fotis at an Avon uh, Connecticut restaurant sometime after Jennifer left the home. Fotis insisted on telling her over and over again that his wife was crazy and that she was a pill popper. And to be brutally honest here, captain, I'm kind of dumbing that down a little bit. It, it was, it went on and on and on with this guy mm-hmm. trying to convince this person that Jennifer was just some crazy uh, pill popping unfit mother. Yeah. I mean, he, <laughs> he's trying to say, Hey, she's crazy for wanting to divorce me even though I'm cheating on her. Well, he's one hell of a skier. Yeah. So we already named the woman that Fotis was having an affair with, Michelle one Draconis. Of them. Uh, it possibly could have been more. Well, a little background here. It, it, I mean, it appears that their relationship was pretty tight. Michelle was seven years younger than Fotis. She worked at Four Group with him at some point. She was from Venezuela, went to college in Argentina, and had been a TV host and producer for a ski show on ESPN, on the ESPN network in Argentina. Of course, Michelle moved in with Fotis, and she was a mother to a preteen daughter who lived with the both of them. Mm -hmm. Now, Jennifer requested that the court prevent her kids from being exposed to this woman that her husband was living with. In January of 2018, after months of back-and-forth legal motions and hearings, Jennifer again filed a request for an emergency custody order. This time, a different judge found that Fotis had violated court orders multiple times. He lied under oath and manipulated his kids into lying for him. And a psychiatrist hired by the Guardian ad litem found that Fotis' actions were causing psychological harm to the children. For people who don't know what a guardian ad litem is, it's a, it's basically the lawyer for the children that is appointed by the court. 
So they act in the best interests of the children. They um, interview the children about each parent. They also interview the parents and other people around them to get an idea of how the inner household works. Yes, and I think this is so important, and I love that we do this because you can't trust going into this. You know, you're you're thinking, of course, both these parents would have the children's best interest at heart, right? But that's usually not. Well, I shouldn't say usually, but a lot of the times it's not the case. I guess right because one of them could be trying to manipulate the system or try to work things in their favor. Look, I understand that our judicial system is in, in in the courts system that we have is not perfect, but it's things like this. You think? Well, but it's things like this that remind me that it is a good system, that it's set up to be a good system, and it's one of the better ones in the world. Well, look, there's a lot of people out there that are good parents. They're just bad at being married. So, but going through that process of the dissolution of the marriage, people can act like fools. And so I think by having the guardian ad litem in place, it kind of calms that down as far as the parents interaction and relationship with their kids during this process. On March 20th, 2019, just last year, the court definitively awarded Jennifer sole physical custody of the kids and final decision making authority regarding the children. Botus was awarded only regular supervised public visitation and recorded speakerphone telephone calls with the kids. Specifically, he would be allowed to see his kids on Wednesdays and alternating Fridays and Saturdays for a couple of hours at a time, but again, only in the presence of a court-appointed supervisor and in public places. He could not have private conversations with with the kids or speak to them in Greek. He was not permitted to enter the home where Jennifer and the kids lived under any circumstances. Any communication between Jennifer and Fotis was also restricted and was to be monitored by the court. On May 24th, 2019 at 6 59 PM, the new Canaan Connecticut police department received a report Jennifer Doulis, who resided at 69 Wells Lane, was believed to be missing. This was filed by phone by a friend of Jennifer's, Laurel Watts. The friend received a call from Jennifer's nanny. Remember, Lauren. We have a Laurel and a Lauren, who was with the with four of Jennifer's children in New York City. The way this comes about, Captain, is Jennifer missed three scheduled appointments that day. Not only that, Jennifer is not answering the nanny's calls and text, something she said never happened. And remember, by this point in time, in our timeline, Lauren has worked for Jennifer for over six years. So we seem to have a serious situation here. Jennifer Doulis is reported missing. Cheers, mates. Cheers to you, Captain. After police received the call, two officers drove out to Jennifer's residence. Once there, they are trying the usual tactics, knocking on the doors and windows, looking in the windows and calling Jennifer's cell phone. They are getting absolutely zero response. So after many failed attempts to reach Jennifer or get someone to answer the door, Lauren over the phone, gave the officers the code to the keypad on the three-car garage. The officers made their way in. Immediately, they spotted, quote, suspected blood evidence. This is found on the floor on the and on the driver's side of a Range Rover parked in the middle bay. Mm -hmm. So right away, this welfare check, this possible missing persons call, is going to turn into a full-blown investigation. 
The investigators find additional evidence, specifically several suspected fresh blood stains on the garage floor, spatter on the wall, drops of blood, and partial bloody shoe prints. A black 2017 Suburban SUV was missing, this according to the nanny. So the very smart New Canaan PD contacted the Connecticut State Police Western District Major Crime Squad for investigative and crime scene processing. So almost immediately, this is a joint criminal investigation between the new Canaan PD and the Connecticut state police. Yeah. Plus we're, we at some point we're going to get others involved and this will include federal and other local agencies at 69 Wells lane. This whole place now, obviously captain is a crime scene. Police quickly established a timeline of Jennifer's morning. First, she drove her Suburban and dropped the kids off at school, this at 7.58 a.m. Surveillance footage collected from the area shows she returned home immediately thereafter, arriving at 8.05 a.m., parking the Suburban in the garage. The door closed behind her. She was not seen after that time, and no other vehicles left from or arrived to the home until the Suburban left again at 10.25 a.m. Even more troubling, around 8.30 p.m. that night at Waverly Park, this is just three miles from the home, Jennifer's Suburban was found abandoned. The black one. Yeah. So this is a 300 acre park in New Canaan and it's a fancy park. There are wooded areas, but it's a city park, not a state forest. Right. At this time, the New Canaan police issued a silver alert for Jennifer and her family issued a statement to the public as well, asking for help and or witnesses. So by this time, Captain... Law enforcement are searching both the park and the home. Let's go through their findings. Crime scene techs at the home went to work swabbing the garage and surfaces inside the home as well. They found blood spatter in the garage, on the wall, and on the driver's side door of the Range Rover, as well as a large stain or stains on the garage floor that appeared to be cleaned up blood. This was wiped in a manner that left obvious stains to the trained eye. Partial bloody shoe print impressions are found on the garage floor. Droplets of blood were in various spots on the exterior of the Range Rover. Well, it seems like there was blood evidence all over this garage. There was even blood that was found on both garbage cans and on the handle of one of the garbage cans as well. All of this blood proved to be of human origin. Now, a little side note here. There are many news articles that state that blood was found on a tablet and cell phone, which was found in the master bedroom. This is not true. It's Uh not true. A tablet and cell phone were found in the master bedroom. They were taken into evidence, but they didn't have blood on them. And to push it a step further, it's unclear whose phone in tablet this was right inside the house. There was no indication of a struggle or a confrontation. The attack seemed to have been limited to just the garage. As for the suburban that was found in the park, when it was located, it's lights, it's running lights were on and it's transmission was in reverse blood spatter and other blood evidence was found on both the interior and exterior of the vehicle including the rear cargo area. The weather tech, hashtag not a sponsor, rear cargo mat was missing from the vehicle. Hashtag can be a sponsor if the money's right. I love weather tech. Investigators pulled <laughs> Jennifer's cell phone records and determined the following. The last text from her phone was to the nanny, to Lauren, at 7.57 a.m. on the morning of the 24th. Yeah. Then the phone left the Wells Lane home around 10.30 a.m. and arrived at the Waverly Park around 10.38 a.m. 
it remained there in the same location in the park until it was disconnected from the network at 11.09 a.m. when it last pinged near a tower, uh, on a tower, I'm sorry, near the park. The phone has never been located that we know of. If it, if it has been found, we've not been told that by police. Right. Police did, man, they did so much work in this case. It's very impressive, not only how much work they did, but how quickly they moved and how smart their movements and tactics were here. They collected surveillance footage from nearly 80 sources. Primarily, this would be neighbors and businesses near Jennifer's home and the park. Right. So they got footage from all the major roadways in between New Canaan and the Farmington area. Video showed that at around 1025 a.m., a black 2017 Chevy Suburban pulled out of Jennifer's garage and drove off. Various cameras captured it driving a route toward the park where it was eventually found. Police surmised that Jennifer's phone was inside the vehicle because her cell phone arrived in the park area at 1038 a.m., basically the same time. As noted, this footage showed no vehicles arriving or leaving Jennifer's property other than her black Suburban. So it looks like the person or persons involved in her disappearance, and this is from... uh, Others, others statements, quote, entered the residence from an area not covered by surveillance cameras and quote, according to police records, surveillance footage also captured a vehicle traveling northbound on the Merritt Parkway going away from the park and toward Farmington. This at 11, 12 a.m., just three minutes after Jennifer's phone went off of the network. So. According to the time frame police had now established, there was a 30-minute gap between when Jennifer's phone arrived at the park and when it was shut down at 11.09 a.m., right? right? And then three minutes later, just three minutes later, someone is seen on video driving away. At 1.01 a.m. on May 25th, the New Canaan PD called Fotis Doulis and asked him some very basic questions. One of these was the date of his last visit to New Canaan. Right. He responded that it was on May 22nd, when he had last had a supervised visit with his children. The day after Jennifer was reported missing, May 25th, Fotis met with New Canaan police at headquarters. This was at 2.40 in the afternoon. He was very polite in the manner that he showed up about three hours late for the scheduled uh, meeting. Uh, Detectives had to sit there waiting on him. Now, upon request, Fotis did hand over his iPhone and gave them the passcode to the phone. But he very quickly demanded it be returned when he realized they intended to keep it. Like, like we didn't want to just look at this for a couple seconds, dude. We, we, we're going to analyze your phone. And he's like, oh, crap, I need that back. Well, he was just embarrassed by all the dick pics he had saved. The police informed Fotis that he had, that they had secured his phone with the intention of obtaining a warrant to search its contents. Basically, they're saying, we don't have the warrant yet. You've handed us your phone. You want it back. We only asked for it because we intend on getting a search warrant, and I'm sure they're probably telling him there's no reason why we wouldn't be able to secure this warrant. You're at a loss here, buddy. So immediately when this goes down, Fotis says, end of interview, and he leaves. Now, he did have an attorney present for all of this, this going on here. Now, a forensic exam of Fotis's cell phone plus a second phone that he was required to turn over pursuant to the search warrant that we just mentioned gave police some more information. According to the search and seizure affidavit, Fotis's phone had answered a call on the morning of May 24th. That's the morning in question at 824 a.m. But Fotis' attorney made several public statements about Fotis having an alibi phone call. Presumably, this was it. Supposedly, a call from a friend in Greece, but there was more. 
They also discovered the following. From approximately 10 p.m. on May 23rd until 1.16 p.m. on the 24th, Fotis's phone was at his residence at 4 Jefferson Crossing, which, again, is also his office. Right. The alarm on the cell phone had gone off at 4.20 a.m. on the 24th and was manually shut off immediately thereafter. The phone stayed at the home and received incoming calls and text, but showed no outgoing activity. At 1.16 p.m., the cell phone left Fotis's residence and traveled to another home owned by his company, the Four Group. This was at 80 Mountain Spring Road in Farmington, 2.1 miles away. It arrived there at 1.37 p.m. The phone stayed there for more than two and a half hours before traveling back to Fort Jefferson Crossing, this at 4.17 p.m. Then at 5.21, the phone returned to the Mountain Spring Road home and then went back to Jefferson Crossing again. Then at 7.10 p.m., the phone traveled to Albany Avenue in Hartford, Connecticut. Now, anybody that has followed this case knows what's going to go down here because this was all over the news. Before we get into that, a little explanation of geography is in order here. From the upscale Farmington and Avon suburbs, where Fotis and family had bounced around from new construction to new construction, Albany Avenue is the most direct route into downtown Hartford. In just a matter of four or five miles, Albany Avenue takes travelers directly to the inner city. Along with Fotis's phone on Albany Avenue for half an hour between 7.10 and 7.41 p.m. was Michelle Traconis's phone. Mm. Intrigued by this movement of the phones, investigators obtained surveillance footage from the Hartford PD cameras that are located throughout the city. Right. This is going to be able to tell them how many people are in the car, possibly. Yeah, and the vehicle that we're talking about, the footage captured a black Ford Raptor pickup truck making multiple stops, stopping multiple times at multiple locations. Those are expensive trucks. This is along several miles of Albany Avenue. Now, this surveillance footage did not capture the license plate of the vehicle, but police were able to determine that the Raptor bore many similarities to one owned by Fotis Dulles. Video footage showed several black trash bags in the bed of the truck. So what was this truck doing, driving along, stopping every 100 yards or so? Well, they could see a Caucasian male wearing a baseball hat and a light-colored shirt emerging from the vehicle at each stop and placing garbage bags in trash receptacles. One portion of the video also captured a woman of thin build leaning out of the truck. Another piece of video showed the man inserting an object into a storm drain at the corner of Albany Avenue and Garden Street. Did you say inserting? I did. Okay. Inserting an he item. Was inserting? Should have got Morgan to say these lines. <laughs> Surveillance footage also showed the man disposing of a rug, or could it be the missing WeatherTech mat right. from the rear of the Suburban? Investigators pulled video surveillance from Fotis's neighbors' homes, and see that's the thing that people don't they, they people's murderous brains have not caught up to technology yet. Everybody's got a camera on their on their doorbell now. Yeah. Everybody's got cameras. They're they're cheap to install. We've advertised several great brands on this show. You can put them on your house, and guess what? If your neighbors are up to some dirty deeds. Done dirt cheap. Done dirt cheap or doing them, you know, some do-it-yourself done dirt. (laughs) I can't even talk. (laughs) They're going to catch you on camera. Uh And that's what we're seeing here, Captain. They see video surveillance from his neighbor's homes that show the Ford Raptor arriving at Ford Jefferson Crossing at 820 that, or sorry, 812 that night. Right. It would have taken about 20 minutes to get back to that address from Albany Avenue. So this is all lining up. There's a lot of things to suggest that the person that they're seeing in that Raptor that's making the stops is, in fact, Fotis Doulis and his girlfriend at the time. Yeah, we got to make sure that that is Fotis in 13. 
Well, police seized the Raptor, this on May 31st. It was just one of several vehicles Fotis had registered to him. On the same day, the 31st, a week after Jennifer vanished, detectives obtained warrants to collect DNA and fingerprints from Fotis Doulis and Michelle Traconis, who have not been, by this point, even remotely helpful in this investigation. While detectives sat outside of their house awaiting for the return of the couple, they had a bit of luck. You know, sometimes you get lucky in these investigations. This guy, and I'm, I struggle with his first name. I think his first name, Captain, is Powell, uh-huh. but his last name is Gaimini. He's the project manager for Fotis's company, an employee of Fotis's. He drove up in a vehicle registered to the company. This is a a Jeep Cherokee. Detectives inquired as to what he had been doing. He told them that he stopped by Fotis's other house in Avon to remove the seats from Fotis's Porsche. This was at Fotis's insistence. Okay. There, the seats from this Porsche yeah. were in the back of this Jeep. This is obviously strange, right? Right. When Michelle and Fotis showed up that evening, they were ordered to drive to the state police barracks. There, detectives obtained DNA, hair, and fingerprint samples from both. And when they did so, they noticed Fotis was covered in poison ivy. Now, of course, Fotis is a builder. His defense, no doubt, that this could be from any of his building sites. But what's interesting here is that within a week of his wife vanishing, right. Fotis developed symptoms that he was possibly in the woods at some point. Afterward, both were permitted to leave the police station. Then just a week after his wife was reported missing, Fotis Doulis was arrested on June 1st, 2019. Right. The charges tampering with physical evidence and hindering prosecution. So they were able to positively ID him on that, that footage, dropping trash can bags into sewers and, and other places. I think that to get a 100% confirmation that it was in fact him and Michelle, they're not 100% on it, but they're pretty darn close. They got a they got a lot of things backing up their statement that they say we believe this to be Fotis and Michelle. Right. Now his mugshot when he's arrested, Fotis's head nearly shaved at this time. A former neighbor told us that Fotis never shaved his head before. So this is weird. Is he trying to change or disguise himself in some manner? Yeah, we see this constantly. Fotis's criminal attorney, Norm Pattis. At least made, he didn't dye it bleach blonde like Scott Peterson did. I noticed you showed up to the garage today fully bald. Oh, yeah. <laughs> fully shaved. That's, uh, that's the work of the Lord. Um, Fotis' criminal attorney, this, his name is Norm Pattis. He made public statements that Fotis could not have been involved in what happened to Jennifer on the morning of the 24th of May. As he had been on the phone, this was a call. He took a phone call at this time. He also said that Fotis' girlfriend, Michelle Traconis, could provide him a complete alibi for that morning. Now, we should point out, though, on the day that Fotis was arrested, Michelle, too, was arrested and charged with the same charges. During the arrest interview of Michelle, she told detectives that Fotis was home with her on the morning of the 24th and that they had been intimate in the shower. Yeah, I don't believe a thing this piece of shit has to say. She said that she made breakfast for her daughter and drove her to school that morning. Fotis was in the four-group office with his business lawyer, Kent Mawiney, 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 something like that, mm -hmm. at 8.15 a.m. She did errands. She ran errands between 9 and 11.30 a.m. This included a drop-off of a purse to a friend who had left it at her and Fotos' home the night before, a trip to Simsbury Stop and Shop, where she took pictures with the store robot. You know, like some stores have a, you know, a mascot of sorts. Okay. That's 
what I take this to be the store robot, Marty. Uh, <laughs> in another visit, she made to a different friend's house. She danced around the question of whether Fotis was home all of this time. You know, she's simply saying when I left, he was still there right. and his business attorney was there with him. And when I got back, they were both still there. So that's her way of kind of saying that he was at the house the whole morning without fully saying, I saw him at the house the entire morning. Right. So she says that at some point she had lunch with Fotis that day. I'm guessing this would be right around the time of when we have the police saying Fotis's phone finally leaves the house. What makes for a decent alibi is we know Fotis's phone was by the police's statements located in that home all morning long until they left for lunch. Right. The problem is all activity on the phone is coming into the phone. None of it is going out. She said that later that day, Fotis called her and asked her to come over to the other home. This is the 80 mountain spring Roadhouse, to help clean it for a showing the next day. She brought over a vacuum, Swiffer, paper towels, Clorox, and garbage bags she said she arrived between 2.15 and 3 p.m., but we actually know this to be different. It was 1.37 p.m. Fotis is visible on surveillance footage driving his Suburban. This is a different Suburban for those keeping score at home. Over to the Mountain Spring Roadhouse at 1.36 with Michelle following in the Jeep. And they clearly arrived at the home at 137. We have video footage backing this up. Right. But at some point, wouldn't her phone and his phone track together, like as far as like the cell phone ping technology? Yeah, they, they know this to be the case. And they're going to ask her why, you know, why is your phone and his phone traveling along Albany Avenue on the night of May 24th at the same time? Right. To which Michelle said Fotis wanted to go to Starbucks in West Hartford. She admitted to investigators that Fotis drove the Raptor and that he did stop multiple times to deposit items wrapped in trash bags into receptacles. She told them that she did not know what was in the trash bags and that she really didn't know what he was doing. She said that she was on the phone the entire time and really wasn't paying any attention. Michelle confirmed that the video footage obtained by the police of the Raptor was, in fact, of her and Fotis. So she's cooperative on that level. Yeah, but she's, yeah, I, I, that's me. That's him. That's his Raptor. But I don't know what he was doing, and I wasn't paying attention. Yeah, you'd think you'd ask. We also have footage that shows, this is from the Starbucks that she mentioned. It shows the couple entering the store at 7.59 p.m., Fotis and Michelle both posted bond and were released from police custody. They were required, though, to wear ankle monitoring bracelets. They were required to remain in the state and to surrender their passports. Well, both that's of these cute that they got matching bracelets. Yeah, both of these individuals would be considered flight risk. So you you have to take some additional steps to make sure that they are going to stay and actually. You're, that you will see them in court eventually. Right. The next day, police executed an unannounced search warrant of Fotis's house. This is when they seized the following items. Various computers, servers, flash drives, and hard drives, stop and shop plastic trash bags, seven cell phones, and the trash can in the office. This is in the trash can of his office. They found a document. It outlined the activities, and I'm using air quotes there, of Fotis and Michelle on Friday, May 24th, and Saturday, May 25th. It mirrored exactly what Michelle told investigators about Fotis being home with her and Fotis having a meeting with his business lawyer. This appears to be a cheat sheet to help them prepare for the interrogation. You know, let's get our stories straight. Now, police want to talk to yeah. Michelle again because, as ZZ Top would say, they got me under pressure. Mm -hmm. Her story is going to change. She admits that she cannot account for Fotis's whereabouts on the day in question from about 8 a.m. until noon or maybe even 1 p.m. 
She goes on to tell the detec- detectives when she woke up at 6.40 a.m., Fotis was home, but he left the house soon thereafter and left his cell phone in the home office. She says sometime around 1, they had a quick lunch before Fotis left again at approximately 3 p.m. Mm-hmm. She received the call from Fotis asking her to bring the cleaning supplies to the Mountain Spring Road property. Again, we know that this was closer to 115. At around 4 p.m., Fotis' employee, Guy Meany, arrived. And again, we have video footage to suggest that this was actually at 5 p.m. At around 5.20 p.m., she says she went home. Detectives confronted Michelle with the handwritten notes that they had found in the trash. Michelle admitted to investigators that this list of specific times and activities was written by her and Fotis to, quote, help them remember, end quote, what they did on the 24th. She said these were all false. The notes were false. De- detectives referred to the notes as the alibi script. Right. So how are they false? They're just, she's saying somebody else made them up? Well, remember, her story changes. Mm. The, the notes that they find on this document are of the first story that she gives to detectives. Now, once they're showing, hey, we got evidence that this stuff isn't real, she's walking it back right. and saying, look, okay, this... Th- these are false statements that we wrote on these notes. This was to, yes, it was to help us remember what we did that day, but they're, they're all a lie. She admitted to detectives that Fotis said to her at one point in their relationship that I hope Jennifer disappears. Detectives told Michelle that they believe Fotis killed Jennifer and involved Michelle by making her clean up. Right. She said, quote, I hate him because of that, end quote. She also said, and this this is weird, that she had been cleaning the house, not cleaning Jennifer. Take that for what you will, but I find that statement uh, to be what? disturbing. Well, she's basically implying that she was cleaning the house and that Fotis was cleaning the body of, of Jennifer. Investigators said Michelle continued to provide answers which were vague, evasive, and contradictory. They believed that she was withholding a significant amount of information. And they also said that they had identified several aspects which indicate a significant amount of pre-planning prior to this crime. The detectives returned to the Jefferson Crossing house with Michelle on June 7th. They were seen searching the woods behind the home. We don't know if anything was found during these searches, but it appears not only is she walking back her statements and changing her story, that she might be working with police at this time. Pal Gaimini. Now remember, he's the guy that removed the car seats from the Porsche, placing them in the back of the Jeep. Gaimini told them, meaning investigators, the following. He says on May 24th, he was working a four-group construction site in New Canaan. This is 3.4 miles from Jennifer's house. He was driving the Ford Raptor registered to the four-group each day of that week. Earlier that week, on Monday, the 20th, Gaimini parked his own vehicle. This is a red Toyota Tacoma in the driveway of Fotis' place and drove the Raptor most of the week. This apparently is normal practice. He typically would switch out the vehicles at the end of the work week. On the 23rd, he did not see Fotis all day until he received a text at 2.13 when he was asked if Gaimini was planning on returning to the office. Gaimini got there around 4.30 and says no one was home. So he proceeded over to the house at 80 Mountain Spring Road, also owned by the four group, arriving at 4.58. When Gaimini arrived, he was surprised to find Fotis and Michelle at the home and asked them what they were doing. They responded that they were cleaning. Gaimini's Tacoma, his truck, was there as well. 
Gaimini and Fotis left at 5.02 to shuttle the two four-group vehicles, the Raptor and a black Suburban, back to four Jefferson Crossing. Michelle stayed behind with the white Jeep and Gaimini's Tacoma. Fotis then drove Gaimini back to Mountain Spring Road to pick up his own vehicle, the Tacoma, but it was locked. Michelle had locked it and taken the keys. Fotis asked Gaimini to just keep the Raptor over the weekend, and he, Fotis, would return the Tacoma to Gaimini later. Right. Gaimini declined, and Fotis had to call Michelle at 5.16 p.m. to drive over with the keys. Gaimini got into his own vehicle, the Tacoma, and drove home. This may seem on the surface as a lot of nonsense, but really, Captain, what does this look like? To, to, to me, it looks like Fotis is trying to set up a situation where he is able to keep the Tacoma right. and use this other guy's vehicle for what we don't know. Now, laid out in the second arrest warrant, detectives have identified the vehicle used in the commission of the crime as a 2001 Toyota Tacoma. Gaimini said that he had been told by Fotis to discard the old seats in his Tacoma. Take out the seats of your truck, man, and throw them away and replace them with seats taken from my Porsche. This, plus the fact that Fotis had access to the vehicle all week, made detectives extremely suspicious. Yeah. They went back and pulled surveillance footage along likely routes between Dulles's residence and the crime scene. And sure enough, they found the red Tacoma belonging to Gaimini traveling at various points between Farmington and Lapham Road in New Canaan on May 24th. Specifically, the red Tacoma traveled southbound on Merritt Parkway and went to uh, New Canaan. A school bus dash cam video spotted the Tacoma parked at 740 a.m. at a turnaround on Lapham Road. This is 100 feet from where Jennifer's Suburban was found. So if somebody attacked her in the garage, placed her and, and presumably killed her there, right. placing her in her own Suburban, drove it and moved it to the park, mm -hmm. who knows where it went. You know, Now we have this vehicle parked 100 feet away that you could use as some type of getaway vehicle if you needed to leave the Suburban there. So the red, the red Tacoma was seen on video on the Merritt Parkway. This is northbound in New Canaan at 11, 12 a.m. The rim of a bicycle is visible in the back of the truck. It turned into the driveway at 80 Mountain Spring Road at 12, 22 p.m. Mm -hmm. So detectives used the Toyota Tacoma footage as well as the footage obtained earlier of Jennifer's Suburban to, to conclude the following. Fotis is believed to have been lying in wait at 69 Wells Lane for Jennifer to return home. The crime and cleanup are believed to have occurred between 8.05 and 10.25 a.m. Doulis is believed to have been operating the, ve the victim's vehicle, the Suburban, mm -hmm. which is carrying the body of Jennifer Doulis and a number of other items associated with the crime, which occurred in the garage of the residence. Now, Lauren Alameda, the, uh, she's the, the nanny, detectives interviewed her at length. Amongst other details, she said a couple of days before Jennifer disappeared, Fotis showed up hours early for a supervised visit with the kids. So this visitation was always on the same schedule. And he's early, but he's acting confused. Like he doesn't know that right, he's right. He, plays dumb. Yeah. So Lauren said that on the morning of the 24th, she arrived at Jennifer's house. This at 1130 AM. She noticed that the suburban at this time was gone, but the Range Rover was still there. As we know, parked in the garage, she saw Jennifer's purse on the floor in the doorway between the mudroom and the kitchen. And Jennifer's mug of tea and an unopened granola bar were on the kitchen counter. Lauren washed the mug 
And as she reached for a paper towel, she noticed that the roll was depleted. So she went to get another from the 12 pack that she had purchased the previous day. To her astonishment, only two rolls were left. As she stated to detectives, quote, I sat there and wondered what happened last night that they used 10 rolls of paper towels. Yeah, very fishy. Lauren also said that she noticed the rear mudroom door, which led outside. It was unlocked, which is extremely strange. This is a door that was always kept locked. Throughout the day, the day in question, she said she texted and called Jennifer, never getting any answer or response. Meanwhile, Jennifer was missing appointments. Just before 7 p.m., she and... Jennifer's friend, Laura Watts, decided to call the police department. Now, they told officers that Jennifer was missing and she was going through a divorce with a man, this is one part that we left out earlier, who had threatened her in the past and they knew him to own a firearm. Detectives had Lauren view crime scene photos of the garage and she was very familiar with the setup there and, in fact, had just cleaned the garage for Jennifer on the 21st. So just three days earlier, she noted that two things were missing. One was a cleaning supply bucket full of cleaning materials that would be used by the housekeeper. The second item that was missing was a set of camping pillows that would be used by the kids. As we said, investigators conducted testing of the house at Wells Lane. The evidence collected there, according to one of the arrest warrants, was a mixture of biological material of the victim, Jennifer Doulis, and that of her husband, Fotis Doulis. Jennifer's blood was all over the garage, and Fotis's DNA was found in a smear of Jennifer's blood left on the kitchen faucet inside the home. And that's important because he was ordered not to go in that house. Correct. So looking at this, you're thinking, okay, this attack occurred. Jennifer lost this fight. Fotis probably was the attacker. And whatever happened, he may have went inside afterwards and washed up. Tests performed on 14 swabs taken from the Suburban registered to Jennifer that was found in the park provided damning evidence. There was blood inside the vehicle, on the upholstery, and on the mats. Mm. This blood did match Jennifer's. Well, and like you were saying, too, they're driving down a road with multiple bags and disposing them, and they, they did recover some of them, correct? Yeah, they retrieved the item that was inserted to the storm drain. But and, but, but not the trash cans? Well, w- we'll get into that because that, it gets quite a bit complicated. Uh, this whole story is frankly complicated. But in the storm drain, they find a FedEx box. Inside the box, two license plates. Both plates had altered numbers and letters. Somebody, somebody dummied them up. All right. These plates were expired, but at one time had been registered to Fotis Doulis. Right. So another piece of evidence suggesting that it was him, in fact, on that video, not to mention that we have his girlfriend claiming that it was them that they saw on the video. They did go and they they raided, let's say, those trash cans that you had mentioned. They conducted a three-week search of materials uh, and recycling authority trash plant in in Hartford. This is where all the garbage from those bins and dumpsters would have eventually ended up. Uh, The vast majority of the trash collected from the 24th, apparently they're they're to burn it in this area, had not been burnt yet. Right. uh, Because the plant was, this is, they got lucky again on the investigation. The plant was a day behind schedule because of the Memorial day holiday. Right. Right. So it had not all been fully processed and I guess they run it through some kind of shredding process before they incinerate it. It had gone through this shredder process. So this is going to make things again, complicated. The amount of garbage from the Albany Avenue area that police 
using police dogs as well had to sift through was piled as high as 20 feet over an area half the size of a football field. 15 to 20 detectives went through 30, it's estimated at 30 to 35 tons of trash daily for three weeks. Police also executed a major search along Albany Avenue on May 31st, utilizing canines and troopers on the ground and air searches as well, trying to find all the things that were dumped by Fotis along his drive. In these painstaking searches, police were able to recover some two dozen evidentiary items, which included garbage bags containing women's clothing a with a substance on the items that appeared to be blood, plastic zip ties, which were stained with what appeared to be blood, a white t-shirt stained with what looked like blood, a bra with blood on it, a black leather work glove with blood stains, a bath towel with red stains, cleaning and household goods such as a kitchen sponge, again with red stains. These items were submitted to the Department of Emergency Services and Public Protection Forensic Laboratory for forensic testing. On June 10th, the report from the lab came back. The substance on many of the items was determined to be blood, and it was the blood of Jennifer Doulis. But the chief state's attorney stated in an interview that police found no evidence of Jennifer's actual body being in the Hartford trash plant. For everything true crime, make sure you check out truecrimegarage.com. Thank you for joining us in the garage today. We will be back here tomorrow. We want to see you there. Until then, be good, be kind, and don't litter.